Well, thanks, Andrew. I, I completely agree. By the way, if you don't know Erin Wise, director of our Shepherd's Heart Ministry, if you ever have a chance to get to know her, ask her to tell you a story because God is doing so many amazing things through that ministry, and she is a great storyteller of the hand of God at work through Shepherd's Heart, and we're very grateful for her and for all of you who contribute to Shepherd's Heart and all that's going on here at Chapel Street Church. And so whether you're tuning in uh, from your home on Facebook, on YouTube, or on our website, we're just glad you're with us uh, to dig into God's Word as we can continue in our series called Choosing Joy. And we're going to be focusing on Paul's words, which you saw there in the intro video, rejoice always. Again, Paul says, I'll tell you rejoice. And that can feel to us like, well, I don't feel like there's a lot of reason for rejoicing. As a matter of fact, more and more doctors and researchers are saying that as the coronavirus and the pandemic uh, drags on, levels of anxiety and stress and depression will continue to increase. And they're seeing that happening. Even before COVID-19, the United States was a clinically anxious place. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, 20% of U.S. adults will experience symptoms of some anxiety disorder in a 12-month period. Now, it's important as we talk about this issue, Paul is going to give us in this letter to the Philippians, kind of an antidote to anxiety. We need to distinguish between clinical anxiety disorders which require medication and medical treatment and the anxiousness and worry and fear that all of us struggle with from time to time. For those of us who struggle with these things, even generally, and then add the tension and hostility of our election season, of the racial divide in our country, um, a sermon series on joy, frankly, choosing joy, and Paul's command for us to rejoice always can seem a little bit out of touch. But this passage in Philippians is precisely about how we, as followers of Jesus, can Remain stable and joyful, even in the midst of unstable times. I believe it is profound wisdom that we desperately need right now. So let's turn in our Bibles, if you have your Bible, or you'll watch on the screen, to Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, and read what Paul has to say to us and what God is saying to us as his people today. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, Stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Yodia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What a passage. There's so much in here. And we will get to the specifics and application of this amazing passage. But in the big picture, sort of at the macro 10,000 foot level, Paul is giving the Philippian Christians and us a kind of a fixed reference point by which to navigate in our lives, to orient our lives around something that's solid and stable in the midst of a very tumultuous and turbulent time. You know, before the invention of the compass, before the sextant uh, were invented, before GPS, of course, Ancient mariners, sailors, would navigate by the stars, particularly by the North Star in the Northern Hemisphere. The North Star, Polaris, has a very small rotation in the night sky, and all the other celestial bodies seem to rotate around it. You'll see here an image of Polaris in time-lapse photography, and it looks like all the heavens are rotating around the North Star. Paul is essentially giving us a reference point around which we can orient our lives. When all around us seems to be swirling, something solid, something stable we can fix ourselves on. Even when the waves get rough, we can navigate by this, something we can trust. C.S. Lewis coined two phrases, uh, chronological snobbery and historical amnesia. I like those phrases. His basic point is we're tempted to think that we're smarter, chronological snobbery, and that we are the first ones to face this issue, whatever the issue is. That's historical amnesia. Paul knew a thing or two about anxious circumstances. 
We've told this before, but he wrote this letter from prison. He wrote it while being chained 24-7 to a Roman imperial guard. Nero was emperor in Rome. Paul wrote Philippians, this letter we're studying, in about 61 or 62 AD. Nero was the emperor in Rome. Nero was a bad guy. You're going to see an image here of Nero's face on the screen. Nero was, uh, some suspect insane. He was a bad guy. He also had a very bad neck beard, it appears. Nero um, had his tutor. He studied under the great Roman philosopher Seneca. He had his tutor commit forced suicide. He basically murdered his way to the imperial throne. He was completely brutal, volatile, unstable, and he was the emperor under which Paul would eventually be executed by being beheaded. In fact, two years after Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians, in 64 AD, Nero would launch a massive persecution against Christians. In fact, the the details of this was that Rome experienced a vast fire in the city of Rome, which burned about 65% of the entire city. Some suspect that Nero set the fire himself because he wanted to rebuild a more opulent city. That's not been proven, but he was blamed for it. And he wanted to shift the blame to this small group called the Christians, the Christ ones, people of the way. And there was already some hostility toward them, so he focused that and launched massive persecutions. That's two years after Paul writes this letter. This is the context in which Paul says, stand firm, rejoice. In fact, this passage, Paul gives five imperatives to us. One result and one central foundational reality. And as we work through these things, I hope you will see, as I am beginning to see, how incredibly relevant this is for us today. Okay, the first imperative. Stand firm, Paul says. Stand firm. Now, I don't know about you, when you hear the word stand firm, that phrase, you probably think about a defensive position. Stand your guard. Don't be moved. You know, dig, dig in. Don't let anyone uh, move you off your, your position. You know, attack, defend, dig your heels in. That's not exactly what Paul's getting at. Let me read to you verse, Philippians chapter 4, verse 1 again, when Paul tells us to stand firm. He says, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. He says to stand firm, he says, therefore, stand firm. Therefore is referring to something previous. Let's go back to chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, to see what Paul says we're to stand firm in. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Did you catch what Paul says there? He says our citizenship is in heaven. It's fixed for us. Now, just for some context, Philippi was a Roman colony. In fact, it was named for Philip of Macedon, who was Alexander the Great's father, Uh, the Caesars made this a Roman colony and actually they would give estates, property, to retired Roman generals. So you have this Roman colony and you have retired Roman generals living there, lots of them. And Paul says, Caesar is not God, Jesus is. And you actually, your citizenship is not in Rome, it's in heaven. What he's saying is the church is a colony of heaven on earth. We get this so wrong in our culture. I get this wrong. We struggle with this. The church is not the programs, the the services, and we're looking forward to being back in the building together. The church is a colony of heaven on earth, a collection of God's people, an outpost of the gospel in the world, working for God's vision of justice and righteousness. Not a social vision, but God's vision based on the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. God's vision is that we, his people, called the church, are a colony of heaven on earth. Oh, how we need to recover this right now in the church in America. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our allegiance is to Christ and his kingdom. 
This, this is the North Star. This is the fixed reference point by which we orient all of our lives and we navigate through the crazy, tumultuous, turbulent waves of our culture. So Paul says, stand firm, my beloved, for your citizenship is in heaven. Now, again, standing firm does not mean to resist, to attack, to dig in, to defend with force. Paul is going to go on and talk about things like rejoicing, gentleness, prayer, thanksgiving. These are not words we would typically associate with standing firm. But Paul and God's vision for what it looks like to stand firm is very different from the clenched fist, demanding your rights posture of so many today. Now, verses 2 and 3 of Philippians 4 sound like Paul's sort of having this weird digression and changing the subject. Let me read them for you. I entreat you, I entreat Euodia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Okay, a couple things here. It sounds like a digression, but it's not. These two women, Paul says, Euodia and Syntyche, were fellow laborers with him and Clement in the gospel. That means they're significant. They're leaders in the church. But they had a disagreement. They had some conflict. Now, we don't know what their conflict was because uh, Paul doesn't tell us. But it's likely it was not a gospel issue. Because if it was central to the gospel, the message of truth of Jesus Christ, Paul would have said so because he does that in other places in the New Testament. They had a disagreement or a conflict over what we might call a secondary or tertiary issue. I like to think of this as open-handed and closed-handed issues. There are some things in the church that are closed-handed issues. Is Jesus Christ the only Son of God? Yes. We have to agree on that. Did he physically die and bodily raised from the dead in payment for our sins in the hope of eternity? Yes, we have to agree on that. Is he going to return someday to judge the world and set all things right? Yes. When will he return? How will he return? Well, that's an open-handed issue. We can discuss that. The Bible isn't crystal clear, although some might argue that point. Or, or take this one. Are all people made in the image of God? Yes. Do all people, therefore, deserve uh, to be treated with equity, love, dignity, and, and honor? Yes. Is any form of racism or prejudice or oppression wrong and sinful in God's eyes? Yes. Living in America, should we be working for equity and justice for all people? Yes. What's the best way to bring that about in terms of political policy? Well, that's an open-handed issue. We can debate that. So we don't know what their disagreement was, but I think it was an open-handed issue. And Paul is saying, look, whatever your, this issue is, agree in the Lord, even if your agreement means you agree to disagree. Because what you have in Jesus transcends these other issues. We need to recover this as well in the church in our day. Paul says to them, agree then. In the Lord. Help them, encourage them, remind them that their names are written in the book of life, he says. They belong to Jesus and his kingdom. Their citizenship is in heaven. Don't fight about this stuff. Debate, exchange ideas, of course. But don't divide. Don't cancel each other. Don't fight. Agree in the Lord. Now, it's because Paul says your names are written in the book of life, he can move on to say what he says next. This is the second imperative he gives us. The first is to stand firm. The second, he says, rejoice always. Rejoice always. Now, honestly, rejoicing always it sounds like Paul is a little out of touch. Always? Yes, he says, rejoice always. Verse, chapter four, verse four again, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, in case you weren't listening, I'll say it again, rejoice. This is, these are not the detached musing of, of a man who is uh, sitting on the, on the beach with his toes in the sand. Paul knew, Paul understood suffering in a way that few of us will ever comprehend. 
Rejoice, he says, in the Lord. You could go back if, you're, if you haven't heard it before and listen to a sermon I gave a couple of weeks ago on chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, where we talked about what it means to rejoice in the Lord. And I used the juice box analogy to rejoy ourselves, to reconnect to the joy we have in who Jesus is and what he's done for us. This is actually a, a deeply important spiritual discipline in our lives. To reconnect when you begin to feel anxious and, and disconnected and full of fear and, and, and full of worry and, and full of anger or full of all of the things that would separate you from the love of God, rejoy yourself, reconnect yourself to who Christ is and what he has done. That's what it means to rejoice in the Lord. Our joy is to be constant, not because our circumstances are, but because Christ is always constant. I have a friend, Matt, Matt Caterer. Matt uh, sometimes plays bass in our worship band and um, is a dear friend in the Lord. And Matt will often say, just spontaneously when we're talking, hey, he loves us, almost with tears in his eyes, with a look of joy on his face. He'll say, he loves us, Pastor Jeff. He loves us. Yes, Matt, he does. He loves us. That's what it means to rejoice, to rejoy yourself in the Lord. A joy that is not tied to possessions or followers or fame or family or even election results. But a joy that is tied firmly to Christ. Okay, the next imperative Paul gives us is kind of curious and it's, a, it's interesting, but I think it's really relevant right now. Paul says in verse 5, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Let me read it for you. Let your reasonableness reasonableness be known. Verse 5. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Now this word reasonableness, the NIV, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. The NIV translates it gentleness. The New Living Translation translates it considerate. The Contemporary Christian Bible translates it graciousness or gracious spirit. It's the Greek word epikeos and it means appropriate gentleness or graciousness that comes from a deep confidence. You might translate it quiet strength or quiet confidence. A patient willingness to listen and even to yield without compromising your beliefs or convictions. This is the antithesis of entitlement and always demanding your rights. Paul's saying, let your spirit of grace and gentleness be evident to all people because you know your citizenship is in heaven. Because of that deep confidence and assurance you have in Jesus, which can't be shaken no matter what's happening around you, you can be gentle, gracious, reasonable. You can be deferential to people. You can listen, even defer to people without compromising your convictions. You don't have to win every argument. You don't have to get all of the, the most likes on your Facebook posts. Because you know my citizenship is in heaven. I'm rooted in him, and that can't be taken away. That's what Paul's saying here. A patient, gracious willingness to listen, even yield, without compromising. Because I know to whom I belong. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Why? How? Paul says in the second half of verse 5, the Lord is at hand. In fact, if you like to highlight or underline or circle in your Bible, underline that phrase in the second half of verse 5 of chapter 4 of Philippians, the Lord is at hand. Paul says, let your gentleness be known. Why? Because God is near. It is the nearness of God that gives us assurance and confidence to, to live this way. If, if God is far off and aloof and disinterested or doesn't exist at all or is a figment of our imaginations, then it's pretty hard to listen to those who you disagree with. It's difficult to be reasonable and gentle and gracious. Paul says, or reminds us that our, it is this spirit that should be known, not just something we do internally, quietly, like an inner life we cultivate, but it should be evident to all people. It's an external way that we live. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15, the prophet says, in quietness and confidence is your strength that quietness and confidence in the Lord. Do you live with an awareness of the nearness of God? Do you live each day 
conscious that God is near, that he's at hand, present. What would your life be like if you did? How different would my life or your life be if every moment I was aware of the nearness of God, or the Lord is at hand? Again, Paul doesn't say this is some inner attitude, but it's something we should be known for. I don't think I'm always known for that. I want to be. I want to be known as a man who's gentle, reasonable, gracious, who has a quiet strength and confidence that comes from only knowing that God is near and I belong to him. Now, Psalm 145, verse 18 says, The Lord is near to all, near to all who call on him, who call on him in truth. And I suspect that some of you watching this are thinking to yourselves, well, that's great, Pastor Jeff, but I don't sense his nearness. I don't feel like God is close at all. But Paul is not talking about your feelings. He's talking about a theological fact that whether you feel like it or not, God is near to you. If you are in Christ, he is nearer to you than you can imagine. And this is the basis on which he gives us the next imperative. So first, stand firm. Second, let your reasonableness, your gentleness, your graciousness be known to all people because God is near. And third, do not be anxious. Do not be anxious. Now, take it out of context. If you just lift these four words out of context and and give them as a command, that sounds impossible and frankly ridiculous. I mean, just don't be anxious. It reminds me of the old Bob Newhart sketch, comedy sketch, where he's the counselor and he just yells, stop it, at the woman who's got all these anxieties. Just stop it, stop it. It it doesn't work. But you have to place this command, this imperative, inside of what Paul is saying. It's it's really a beautiful thing. Let me read verse 6 for you again of chapter 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Notice Paul doesn't tell us just what we should not do. He tells us what we should be doing. Pray. Pray, he says. Be thankful and prayerful. Be thankful and prayerful. This is the next imperative. So these two things really, you could say, are one thing. Don't be anxious. Be prayerful and thankful. So we make our reasonableness, our graciousness, our gentleness known to all people. We make our anxieties known to God. Those two things have to go together. Paul says it this way. In everything, not necessarily for everything, but in everything, in every circumstance, in every situation that comes your way. Paul will write later in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 17 And 18, these remarkable words. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. He doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances, but in all circumstances. In everything. In the midst of a pandemic. In the midst of job loss. In the midst of racial injustice in the midst of the uncertainty of an election that feels like it's tearing our country apart. In these moments, give thanks, seek God, rejoice, bring your anxieties to him in prayer. He so he says, in everything, and then he says, with thanksgiving. This is to be the posture of our hearts, gratitude. I uh, have a Tuesday morning group of men that I meet with, and there are a number of guys that meet different mornings of the week to do these very same things. And we memorize Scripture together. We pray for each other. We hold each other accountable. And one of the things periodically we will do is just make a gratitude list. Just sit down uninterrupted for 15 minutes and start free form writing down things that we are deeply grateful to God for. It is amazing if you will settle in and do that uh, how much you fill a page with. It's endless, the things that God has given us and we should be grateful for. And I, what, you, what I find is when you do that, anxiety, fear, worry, it gets pushed out. When you're focused on what you're grateful for and thankful for, there's not a lot of room left over for worry and for anxiety. But even if you're not making a list, 
Paul is saying, this is the posture of your heart. This is the attitude with which we come to him. Gratitude that we even have a God who loves us and listens to us and hears us. You ever notice that when you're really worried about something, you can't think about much of anything else? You obsess about it. It's the only thing on your mind. And when you begin to focus your mind on things that you're deeply thankful for, those things that you're worried about begin to dissipate. So in prayer, we bring ourselves into the presence of God. We become more aware of Him and less concerned with ourselves and our circumstances. So when you're anxious, is it your circumstances that control you? And when you pray, you express confidence in the God who controls your circumstances. So that, these are the imperatives Paul gives us. Stand firm. He says, stand firm because your citizenship is in heaven. And then he says to us, let your reasonableness be evident to all people. Right? Rejoice in the Lord. Don't be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. D.A. Carson puts it this way. The way to be anxious for nothing is to pray about everything. To pray about everything. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Screwtape Letters, and some of you may be familiar with this. For those of you that aren't, it's an imaginary letters between one demon and another. And this older demon named Screwtape is advising this younger demon, uh, Wormwood, on how to tempt, distract, lead astray who he calls the patient, a human being. And in the letter, the phrase the enemy refers to God. Let me read to you what Lewis says about anxiety. I am delighted to hear that your patient's age and profession make it possible, but by no means certain, that he will be called up for military service. So this individual human might get drafted. Written during World War II, 1942 actually. We want him to be in the maximum uncertainty so that his mind will be filled with contradictory pictures of the future. There is nothing like suspense and anxiety for barricading a human's mind against the enemy that is against God. He, God, wants men to be concerned with what they do. Our business is to keep them thinking about what will happen to them. Did you hear that? Lewis is so profound here. God wants us focused on what we can do, which is rejoice, pray, seek him. The enemy wants us focused on the uncertainty of the future. So Paul says to us five imperatives. Stand firm. Rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to all people. Don't be anxious, but be thankful and prayerful. And then he gives us one result. One amazing, incredible promise and result. The peace of God will guard you. If you'll do these things, God will give you his peace. The peace of God will guard you. And he says in verse 7, let me just read it for you. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It surpasses all understanding, Paul says. This does not mean it's irrational. But it, what he's saying is, it doesn't really make sense from a purely human perspective. Because it's available to us, even when, from a human perspective, there's no reason to have peace. There's every reason to be anxious and fearful. Paul says, God will give you his peace, and it will guard you. It will watch over you. Jesus says, by the way, something very similar in John chapter 14, verse 27. Jesus says these words, promising his peace to his disciples and to us. Excuse me, I'm in, I'm in the wrong chapter there. John 14. Verse 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus says, I'm giving you my peace. And it's not what the world offers to you. The peace of Christ is not anything the world can give to you. Jesus says that very plainly. I don't give as the world gives. It doesn't make sense to the world because it's not based on your circumstances. It's not conditional. It's rooted in who he is and what he has done. Two chapters later, chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. 
In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. This is really critical for you to understand. Jesus says, in me you will have peace. Let me put it to you plainly, friends. You cannot have the peace of God guarding your minds and your hearts unless you have peace with God through Christ. This promise here, this result, is for those who have peace with God through Jesus. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, He himself is our peace who has reconciled us to God. What this means is when you come to the recognition that you're sinful to the core and you have no hope in your life without him and you surrender to him and you receive his forgiveness by faith, his grace floods into your heart and he reconciles you to God and you are at peace positionally with God, justified before him because of Christ. Then you can have the peace of God which comes into your life. There can be no peace of God until you have peace with God. Paul goes on and he says, this peace will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. The Greek word is puroreo. It's a, it means a military sentinel keeping watch or a watchtower, a guard tower. Think of that for a minute. God's peace standing watch over you, over your mind and over your heart. There's an image here you'll see on the screen of a lighthouse in a storm. It's a famous image uh, taken by a French photographer. This massive wave striking this lighthouse. And I don't know if you can see this, but if you look closely in the doorway, just above the fence there, is a lone figure, a man standing there in that doorway. And he looks rather casual and calm when the storm is raging. I mean, look at the size of that wave compared to that person breaking. But the stability, the strength of the lighthouse, the watchtower, if you will, that's the image Paul's giving us here. God's peace stands watch, stands guard over you, over your mind and over your heart. When your mind races and you think about all the what ifs and the worst case scenarios and you just can't stop it, God's peace comes in. If you will, stand firm, rejoice, right? Don't be anxious, bring your request to God. His peace comes in and settles you. God's peace stands guard. Let's just take a thought experiment, shall we? Let's take this promise related to the presidential election that's coming in just a few weeks. How many of us have a lot of what ifs running through our mind? What if the candidate I, I, I prefer doesn't win? What if that guy ends up in office? What if those people end up running the country? What if? What if the economy tanks? What if they make the wrong decisions in regard to the pandemic? What if all these things continue that I, that I want to see stopped? Or what if a whole America changes altogether? What if, what if, what if? We need someone to guard our minds. And think of all the emotional angst we have. When you read someone's post on social media that has a very different political ideology than you, and you feel angry, you feel fearful, you feel, how could they think that? We need someone to guide our, guard our hearts. And we have one. We have one who will do that. But it's not magic. We have a role to play in this. Let me remind you. Friends, your citizenship is in heaven. And Jesus says he's going to bring all authorities under his power someday. So stand firm. Your name is in the book of life. You belong to him. You are his and he is yours. So rejoice, always rejoice. Let your quiet confidence, your gentle spirit be evident to all people. And don't be anxious about anything because the Lord is at hand. He's near to you. He's not far off. So bring everything to him in prayer with a spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving and the peace of God which doesn't make sense to the world. But it makes sense to you who know Jesus. It will guard your hearts and your minds. It will protect you from running down all the what-if scenarios. It will realign your heart when you get filled with anger and hatred and fear. It will bring you back to center to true north in him. Oh, how we need this. I need this. I know that we all need this right now.
And so as we close, for some of us, we, we know Jesus, but we get off course. We get tossed by the waves, and we need to recenter, to rejoice, to stand firm, to bring everything to him by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. For others of you, you don't know him. You don't have peace with God. You long for the peace of God, but you don't have peace with God. You can have that through Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Father God, we humbly bow before you and we acknowledge that our minds and our hearts run in a thousand different directions. That we don't always seek your will. In fact, rarely do we seek your will apart from you. That we, left to our own devices, have made and will make a mess of our lives in this world. That we desperately need you. Thank you, Lord, that you have not left us alone. That you are near. And that you long to give us your peace. And the fundamental way you do that, God, is through your son, Jesus. And so, Lord, I just pray right now for all who are watching, who don't know you, that they would, in this very moment, surrender their hearts to you, acknowledge their sinfulness, ask for forgiveness, receive the grace that you can give, and trust that the peace that only you can give will flood into their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.